singing worship together at Fellowship of Christian Athletes at UNC Charlotte. Uh, coming up now on graduations and marriage in a few months. So, uh, so congratulations. <laughs> It was nice they let you sing with them, Dad. <laughs> as, as we begin today, it's, it's an appropriate segue from, from what you're doing because I'm actually starting with a graduation quote. Uh, a graduation ceremony is an event where the commencement speaker tells thousands of students dressed in identical caps and gowns that individuality is the key to success. <laughs> so it's, it's not quite graduation season yet, and you'll see why I'm talking about graduation in just a few minutes, but I do have a few graduation quotes that are frequently used at graduations to, to let you in on some wise pieces of advice. So, uh, Will Rogers, the, the famous old kind of country uh, uh, humorist, used to say, even if you are on the right track, you will get run over if you just sit there. Good advice. Uh, I like this one from comedian Jim Carrey. He said, I learned many great lessons from my father, not the least of which was that you can fail at, you can, it was that you can fail at what you don't want. So, you might as well take a chance on doing what you love. Isn't that kind of cool? Uh, you can Google for an answer. You can Google for a mate. You can Google for a career. But, you can't Google to find what's in your heart. The passion that lifts you skyward. I think this next one is my favorite. If you think you are too small to be effective, then you've never been in bed with a mosquito. <laughs> Here's the reason I'm showing you graduation quotes when it's not near graduation time. Uh, I saw this from Lincoln Christian College. They essentially say, they don't actually use these words, but they essentially say, uh, receive this diploma, you are now equip equipped to lead. And then they say, receive this towel, for you are called to serve. Isn't that a powerful image? Receive this towel, you are called to serve. If you will, go ahead and turn to John 13. It's on page 981 of the Pew Bibles in front of you. Uh, as you're turning there, if you don't know, we have been working systematically through the Gospel of John. We're doing a chapter a week. This week we are up to chapter 13. And as we look at the headings, it begins to set for us a few famous stories and a few famous teachings. So it begins, and just look at the headings in John chapter 13. It essentially begins like this. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus got up from the table, put a towel around his waist, and Jesus washes his feet. This was the night. This was the last night. The next part of it is Jesus foretells his betrayal. And by the way, just so you know, how important was that for the disciples? That they knew what was coming? That they knew that Jesus wasn't surprised? If he was who he said he was, and this completely took them off guard, that Jesus didn't even know he was going to be betrayed. And so he needed to tell them what was happening. The next part is, the next heading is the new commandment. Anybody knew the new, what the new commandment is? I give you a new commandment to... Love one another. And then Jesus foretells Peter's betrayal. Peter, even if, I'm, even if I must lay down my life with you, I'm going to 
And Jesus says, no. Before the cock crows. Three times. Right? All right. So here is our theme. As we look quickly through the Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, I want to set up our theme for today. The first and most important part is, who is Jesus? Now take a look at the first verse. Verse 1 says, now before the festival of the Passover. All right, we have our context now. Where are we in the midst of the story? For, it's kind of funny, I was noticing this when I was talking to my class at Sunday school today. The first paragraph of the Gospel of John takes in all eternity. In the beginning was the Word. It's pretty much then the first 11 chapters of the Gospel of John then. They focus on three-year period of time. Chapter 12 focuses on one week. From Jesus being anointed in Bethany to entering Jerusalem, this is one week's worth of time. And then chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 focuses on what happened that night when Jesus would be betrayed. It's what happened at the Last Supper. It's what happened on the journey out to and in the Garden of Gethsemane. So five chapters take place in about four or five hours worth of time. So here we are in terms of the context. So now before the festival of the Passover, verse 1, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. His hour had come. Jesus used that phrase, that word, hour, many times. For example, in chapter 2, wine was they ran out of wine at a wedding. Remember that? And Jesus' mother goes to him and says, uh, do something. And Jesus says, woman, my hour has not yet come. A couple other times, like in chapter 7 and 8. In one of those chapters, Jesus heals on a Sabbath, and everybody is upset. In chapter 8, he makes the startling claim that he is the light of the world. He uses that God language, I am the light of the world. And in one chapter it says they did not arrest him because his hour had not come. In another one of the chapters it says to them they could not arrest him because his hour had not yet come. But now what time is it? The hour has come. It is time, isn't it? The hour has come. Look at verse 33. Look at the sense of urgency that's there. Jesus, knowing his hour had come, said, Little children, I am with you only a little longer. I'm not going to be here much longer. And you will look for me, but where I am going, you cannot come. And he's talking about that immediacy of death. Now, he's going to be talking about heaven. They might be thinking, why can't we come with you? We want to come with you when he was gone. Why can't we come with you? In chapter 14, he'll clear that up for them. It's the famous passage, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, many mansions. If it were not so, would I told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come back so that I may take you with me. So he's planning to come back. Now Thomas, of course, was like, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says to them, I am the way, the truth and the life. But he is preparing that place for them. But look at verse 36. It begins to maybe explain this a little better. Jesus said to Peter, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now. But you will follow after. You can come to that place afterwards, but in the meantime, I have a job for you here on this earth. My hour is come. It is time for me to leave, but your hour is really just beginning. Right? Okay. So, back to chapter one, verse 1. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to his Father, having... And here's the first key word of who is Jesus. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. If you want to know who Jesus is, if you want to know who God is, one simple thing is love. 
That's who God is. For God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so loved the world that he, the Father, gave his one and only Son. Right? Love. 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. John 15, 13, no one has greater love than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Everything, if we want to understand who Jesus is, has to flow first through that concept of love. And that is set forth from the very beginning of this chapter. Now, immediately, verse 2 sets up a contrast here. Because if God is love, what happens in chapter 2? It says the devil... The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. So Jesus is what? Love. And Satan is betrayal. It is life that Jesus offers versus destruction. It is help and hope versus betrayal and despair. Jesus is forgiveness. Satan is condemnation. This is the pattern all the way through that we see from beginning to end and the contrast is set clear but Jesus is love now we come to the next point and during supper verse 3 Jesus verse 4 got up from the table took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself then he poured water into a basin began to wash the disciples feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him so what words would we maybe attach to Jesus next Maybe service? Maybe humility? I mean, can you imagine the king of all creation steps down and washes the dirtiest part of us? The love, the sacrifice, the humility for the king of creation to do that. I mean, think about the way that, that it was back then with the dusty streets. If I was over here at my house and I took a bath, and got ready to go to your house just across the street. Just crossing the street, I would be clean, but what would my feet be? Dirty. And so there's this sense of you know, what is happening in our lives is that we have been washed, and yet we still continually get dirty. Okay? Now watch this in just a second. We're going to come back to that point, but I want you to go to first of verse 6. Jesus came to Simon Peter who said to them, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? It wasn't right for the king to wash someone's feet. But Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. So what is the third thing that Jesus does? Who is Jesus? He's the one who invites us in. He wants to give us a share. He wants to give us a place in his kingdom. He wants to adopt us into his family. That's who Jesus is. He's not one who pushes us to the outside, but invites us in. And there are two kinds of washings, and Peter almost was beginning to talk about this. First of all, there is that great washing. We call it baptism, the washing of regeneration. And when we are washed, we are clean. We have been cleansed from that original sin that we have, right? But what's the first thing we do when we come to church every Sunday? We confess our sins. After walking along in this dusty world, what happens? We get dirty. Right? We have been washed. We are forgiven. We are part of his family. Peter was part of this family. Who was, when, they, when Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? What did, they all said, well, you know, some people say you're uh, Moses or Elijah or one of the prophets, but who do you say that I am? Who, what did Peter say? You're the Christ, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. When all the people, followers were beginning to turn away from him in John chapter 6, and Jesus turned to the 12 and he said, uh, are you going to go away too? What did Peter say? Lord, to whom shall we go? You and you alone have the words of eternal life. Peter had been washed. And yet, like all of us, just walking through this world, he got dirty. And day after day, he needed that confession to make him clean. If we say we have no sins, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, 
We all need that second and ongoing washings to stay clean. So chapter tw- or verse 12, after he had washed their feet and had put on his robe and had returned to the table, Jesus said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So next, who is Jesus? He's the teacher. But I want to tell you, he's the best kind of teacher. I mean, if you were to think about the best teachers you've had in life, I think Jesus might fit into that category. So listen to what he says next. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Okay? How many of you, when, when someone actually lives as an example of what they're teaching? You know, you've probably seen teachers that just do as I say, not what I do. No, Jesus lived it. He was the perfect teacher. He gave them an example. Jesus, verse 11, said, Now not all of you are clean, for he knew who was going to betray him. Now, first of all, this shows the omnipotence and the omniscience of Jesus. All right? Uh, For example, and we've seen this throughout, like one of the first times we saw the omniscience of Jesus was when Philip brought Nathanael to him, and Jesus said, Oh, I know you. You're Nathanael. You're the one who was sitting under the fig tree. Jesus has this omniscience. But we're not focusing on the power of God and Jesus today. We're focusing on his character. So let's look at that in terms of character. Go to verse 21. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Okay? Now here's where it's more than just knowing. This is Jesus knowing that it's coming and still coming to them. Okay? So it's that sense of he knowingly comes at great personal cost to himself. He knows what's going to happen. This is a costly grace. It's not cheap grace. He knows what's going to happen. Every day, how many of his children are going to betray him? Big ways and small, 100% of us every single day, we're going to betray him. And yet at great personal cost, he comes to us again and again and invites us in. All right? See what love the Father has for us. The last character trait I want you to look at just very quickly. Verse 36, Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now. But you will come, you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. When we know the rest of the story, when we know all that's coming, who is Jesus? He is patient and forgiving. He knows Peter, yet is patient and forgiving. How many of you have ever needed the patience of God in your life? He's patient. He's forgiving. He's loving. He's humble. He's all of these things. Now, just very quickly, we've talked about the first piece of this. There's a second piece. The first one is, who is Jesus? We want to turn now to... Who are we? I want to do this with a story. This week, I've spent a lot of this week driving up and back to a hard-to-reach portion of Maryland, Eastern Shore. Pastor Conda's father died uh, 10 days ago, and the funeral was this week. You'd be very proud of your Pastor Conda. He, He preached the eulogy, and not only did he celebrate the life of his father, but he preached the intersection of where God and his grace had been all the way along in this life. Now, the part that I want to tell you, most of this is Conda's story to tell. I just want to tell two little pieces. Conda said, my dad was born in 1929. He was born 
literally just weeks before the stock market crashed and the Great Depression began. He said back in those days, everyone was poor. They were wondering where the food was going to come from. And Kanda was saying, for whatever reason, and he didn't go into the details, but his family had always a little extra food. I, his dad owned, years later, owned a, a delicatessen. I don't know if that was what his family did, whether they owned a restaurant. I don't, it kinda didn't bother saying whether they were farmers and had extra food. But he said it was a very regular thing to have people knock on the back door. And they would, mom would always have a bag ready with food and would give it to whoever was there. And the part that struck me was that sense of in good families. In good families, we watch our parents and we learn to be like them. We watch their character and we seek to imitate their character. That's what Conda's father did. And it set a path in his life. And that's story one. Here's story number two. One of the songs we sang at the funeral was a famous old Lutheran song. It was Born and Cry. Anybody know Born and Cry? I was there to, be your, to hear your Born and Cry. I'll be there when you were old. I rejoice the day you were baptized to see your life unfold. Now the verses start and you can see the progression through life. I was there to hear your Born and Cry. Uh, I was there when you were but a child. If you find someone to share your time, marriage, uh, in the middle ages of your life, not too old, no longer young, and then when the evening gently closes in. Listen to this phrase. I was there when you were but a child with a faith to suit you well. In a blaze of light you wandered off to find where demons dwell. Have you ever wandered off a little from time to time? Wrestled with those demons? Flirted with a little disaster? I loved what Conda's brother said. He said, it essentially, every time that I'd danced close to the edge of that cliff, flirted with those dragons, was on the verge of falling off. He said, I would see in my mind's eye the face of my father. And deep down, I wanted him to be proud of me. And I'd step back from the edge. Isn't that powerful? Conda's father parents set an example for him. Generosity, food bags in the midst of a depression. We watch someone's character, and we seek to imitate that character. Conda's father then, in turn, turned around and set an example for his sons. In a complicated world, there is a moral path that stays away from cliff edges. And when we watch that character, we often seek the affirmation of that character. Well, on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus set an example for his spiritual children, his disciples, and for you and for me. And we are called not just to seek to imitate character, but we're called to imitate that character. Very quickly, go back to verse 1. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So who was Jesus first? He was love. But look at what he does, verse 33. Little children, I'm only with you a little while longer. Therefore I give you a new commandment that you should love one another. I mean, when I was thinking about the funeral of Pastor Conda's father, they mentioned some of the jobs he had. I mean, he was a commander in the Navy. He was a, uh, he owned a delicatessen. Uh, their meats were so popular, he traveled all over southern Maryland and Virginia, 
delivering meats. But that was that much of the story. No one was there because of those things. They were there because he invested in lives. They were there because of love. That's what matters. Not our accomplishments. They're footnotes on the story. Why people are there with a lump in their throat was because of love. And then it says, verse 3, uh, During supper, Jesus, verse 4, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied the towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. So who was Jesus? Second, he was humble and a servant, right? Right? Look what he does immediately. Verse 12. After Jesus had washed their feet and put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, so you also ought to wash one another's feet. Right? For I have set an example that you also should do as I have done to you. So who are we? We are the ones now who are called to love. We are to be the humble servants. We are to invite others in and teach them the way they should go. We are to live with costly grace because people will sometimes reject what we are giving them. We are to be patient and forgiving. And one more word, obedient. In John 14, Jesus said, I do exactly what the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. We should be saying that. I do exactly what the Son has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Son. How would our world be different if we lived like Jesus? I want to tell you one last quick story. Bible translator's name was Doug Neeland, and his wife Doris, they moved to a village in Brazil. This was about 50 years ago. They moved among what were called then the Fulneo Indians. And when he did, he was called simply the white man. And it was a term of derision because not always had the white men been kind to the people of the Funio tribe. But it says, after the Milans learned the Felino language and began to help the people with medicine and in other ways, they began to call Doug the respectable white man. And then when the Milans began to adopt the customs of the people, the Fulneo gave them greater acceptance and spoke of Doug as the white Indian. Then one day, it says, as Doug was washing the dirty, blood-caked foot of an injured Fulneo boy, he overheard a bystander say to another, whoever heard of a white man? Washing an Indian's foot before. Certainly this man is from God. And from that day on, whenever Doug would go into an Indian home, it would be announced, here comes the man that God sent us. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you sent first your son Jesus into this world and Lord he was more than just an example he is your son living and reigning he is loving and serving he invites us in even when we stumble and sin and betray him again and again Lord we thank you for your son sent into this world And Lord, may we be now your servants, sent to do the same things, to love those 
who feel unlovable, to serve those who don't have much, to minister in the midst of your kingdom, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this call, for this privilege. And Lord, we remember all the ways that you have come and set a feast for us. Lord, from the beginning of time, you came. You created light. You created life. You fed your people with manna in the desert. And in the fullness of time, when you sent your son, Jesus, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Sweet. 
to serve the neighbors we have from you. Neighbors are wealthy and poor, varied in color and race. Neighbors are nearby and far away. Yes, body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May it strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Jesus, you are strong to save. Show. 